Thank you, David, and uh, thank you to CSIS uh, uh, for hosting this event. It's a real honor for me to participate in this discussion, uh, and it's also uh, really gratifying to see uh, TFI, I'm very emotionally tied to TFI, and to see it uh, continuing uh, so successfully under David's excellent leadership as I, as I knew it would. Um, I do have a few policy points to make, but actually I wanted to first take a step back and uh, just offer a few thoughts about how far we've come in 10 years. Um, 10 years ago, I was, uh, no I was nominated but not yet confirmed to be the undersecretary for TFI, along with Juan, who was nominated and not yet confirmed to be the assistant secretary. And I spent some time uh, doing some research and reading up on this office that I was uh, going to be leading, and I read a lot about the history of financial measures and, uh, and sanctions. And I must say, there was a clear consensus. These things don't work. And uh, there, you know, sanctions are some, you know, you, you, you could, anyone who took Economics 101, you know, sanctions, uh, they don't work. They're symbolic at best. They hurt the people you're trying to help by depriving them of things that they need. They don't change the behavior of intransigent regimes. Uh, the, company, the countries that implement sanctions um, they, those are the countries that get hurt because their companies have to give up lucrative business. The countries that honor the sanctions, their, their economies get hurt as well. And it's the countries that cheat that benefit. Uh, and basically, there was a, it was very easy to write an article about the history of how these things fail. So that was really encouraging. And then there was a huge amount of skepticism in Washington about this new office, because if you remember, uh, Treasury had just given up all of its law enforcement uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, and as Juan and I would go up to the Hill and talk to people about this new office, we'd often hear, what do we need this thing for? We, we just created the Department of Homeland Security. Why can't, they, they've got the custom service. Why can't they do all of this stuff? They have an intelligence office. Why can't they do this? Uh, and then on top of that, it was a really, really small organization, and uh, you heard uh, the comment to Secretary Liu, there's 700 professionals now, but at the time, it was very, very small. I think the policy office that, that uh, the big secret we had, the only thing that was really classified was that Juan and Danny Glazer, who were leading the policy office, really only had them and about seven other people, and they were doing all this stuff, and no one knew that it was so small. Um, but overall, the, 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 the situation was pretty demoralizing at the time. Uh, let's just say, and when I uh, reflect on this event, it was pretty hard to imagine an event like this uh, with the Secretary of the Treasury speaking, with two national security advisors talking, the one thing that they, you know, I, I thought was great they agreed on, that uh, the one thing to worry about is that TFI was a victim of his own success and maybe we we're gonna overuse these things in the future. I think that's you know, a, a, a nice to have problem, if you will. Um, and the, the, the transformation that occurred from the beginning until, until now is highlighted in my mind by two anecdotes that both happen to involve Muammar Gaddafi. Um, so very early on in my tenure at Treasury, uh, this is a time when you recall that uh, uh, Gaddafi had given up the WMD programs in Libya, and apparently he was grousing to the State Department that uh, no one had visited Libya. Uh, and so I got the short straw, <laughs> and um, Adam Zubin and I uh, took a trip uh, to, to Libya, and uh, at, the end of the, at the end of our visit, uh, they asked us to, just as we were getting ready to leave, they asked us to get on a plane, and it turns out to be Gaddafi's plane, and they fly us out to the desert, and we go to his oasis, and he's sitting out there, he's got a white track suit on and a sailor's cap and orange sunglasses, and we walk out there and introduce ourselves, and I remember one of the first things he said to me was, um, I'm glad you come, can you deliver a message to George Bush? I want to send a message to George Bush. And I don't remember exactly what I said, but I remember what I thought, which is, I don't think George Bush could pick me out of a lineup. So <laughs> I don't know how this is going to go. So fast forward to my very last day at Treasury, very last day in 2011. Uh, at that time, Gaddafi was uh, conducting attacks on civilians in Libya, uh, and we in the administration were considering putting sanctions on them. And again, I turned to Adam and we, we asked, well, if we put sanctions on, what kind of money are we going to you know, uh, find here in the United States? 
And I come back from a deputies meeting, probably with Michelle and others, and um, I have an email from Adam which says uh, that we, we've canvassed and it looks like there's $20 billion in the United States or so, and he says, that's not a typo, that's billion with a B. And unfortunately for Gaddafi, my ability to get a message to the president had improved. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because I walked over my phone, called Dennis McDonough, talked to Tom Donilon. Literally, by the end of that day, uh, an executive order had been signed uh, by President Obama, and it turned out there was even more than that, uh, that we were ultimately, uh, the Treasury Department ultimately froze for the benefit of the Libyan people. So we had come quite a long way uh, in, in that period. Um, so what, what really had changed? Why, what, what accounts for, for this kind of... Um, this kind of success. And I think, you know, it was great to sit and listen to Secretary Liu and, and, and to listen to Tom Donnell and Steve Hadley. The, the fact is, the, the team at uh, TFI uh, delivered effective strategies in a number of different uh, categories on terrorism, on North Korea, on Iran, et cetera. And, uh, you know, that kind of success breeds success. Uh, and you get more support. And I just want to mention kind of what are, the, what are the features of, you know, why did these things work when the history of sanctions was so, uh, was so unsuccessful? And I point to three, three things. One is, as you've heard, it, we, we focused instead of on country sanctions, instead of uh, putting embargoes on countries, we focused on illicit activity, on bad, on, um, bad conduct. And then when you try to build a coalition, it's not purely political. It's not just the countries that agree politically with the United States, but it's rather those who will stand with you against that kind of activity. And when you're talking about terrorism and money laundering and proliferation, it's pretty easy to build that kind of, uh, that, that kind of coalition because there's a, a huge group of countries and private sector actors who are committed to the integrity of the system. Second, we focused, again, as, as Steve Hadley mentioned, on the private sector explicitly. Uh, and we kind of learned, I would say, that the private sector was perhaps even more important than governments uh, in this effort. Because um, in, when you think about country sanctions and trade sanctions, the private sector has a particular reaction to them. They, they know it's the rules if they have to follow them and they'll try to follow them, but there's no other incentive to go along with it. So they'll do everything they can to go just to the line and try to, try to uh, work around them. But when it's conduct-based sanctions, they have reputational interests. They have their own sense of integrity about the system and they actually will try to amplify what you're doing. And so much of what we have seen the success that uh, the Treasury's had is by having the private sector do much more than is required simply because uh, they, they don't want to be involved in illicit conduct. And we made it a point to reach out directly to the private sector uh, extensively in order to build that part of the coalition. And then you find, once the private sector is working with you, that governments find it easier to go along as well. So if the banks and the big companies in, the, in their country stop doing business with Iran, say, then it's much easier for that country to go along and impose tougher sanctions. And the third thing that uh, characterized these strategies is that they were, all under, under, un, they were all underpinned by intelligence. And this is, I think, the big, you know, what is the one, if I had to point to the one thing that changed in Treasury uh, uh, from 2004 to the present, is that it's, you know, fully a member of the intelligence community. They have full access to the intelligence community. They built a tremendous... Uh, Office of Intelligence and Analysis. I see Leslie Ireland uh, here who, who leads it now. But let me tell you what it was like in 2004. We had a, a grand total of zero analysts in the Office of Intelligence and Analysis at Treasury. And Janice Gardner, who was our first Assistant Secretary, built this thing from scratch. I still remember that our then OFAC Director, Bob Werner, offered her five analysts saying, okay, we'll give, we'll give you five analysts to start with. And uh, we had a hard time moving those five analysts to the Office of Intelligence and because the people on the Hill said, wait a minute, why do you need those people at, at Treasury? And uh, it's, come, it's come a long way. You cannot build this kind of conduct-based uh, strategy without that intelligence. And, um, you know, Iran, which we've heard some discussion of, is the, is the perfect example, right? So. Um, you know, in 2006 or so, uh, Steve Hadley and Secretary Rice, you know, turned to us and said, 
you know, we need a strategy to put pressure back on Iran and uh, to give us some leverage. And at the time, I actually think Steve said it here, he's, you know, there were many people, including people in the White House, thought we were, quote, sanctioned out on Iran. And you could understand that because we had comprehensive sanctions on Iran already. You couldn't do business with Iran in the United States. You couldn't buy their oil. The, our banks couldn't transact with Iran. So the, you know, th those kind of sanctions were already there, and they weren't working. So what we, we had to design a strategy that was specifically designed to get other countries to join us in maximizing pressure and, uh, and get the, the, the world to cut, to cut off Iran. And we came up with a plan that you've seen play out, which is you know, start by focusing on their conduct. And that depended on having the intelligence. And our intelligence analysts pulled together the network of how Iran was funding terrorism, how they were acquiring items for their proliferation program, um, how they were uh, acquiring items for the missile program, and how the private sector was unwittingly involved, how they were part of the transaction chains. And we made it a, a central part of the strategy to go directly to the private sector because, and it was Secretary Paulson who was a, a big advocate of this, he knew, and it turned out to be true, that when you went to these financial institutions and you said, look, you're in this transaction chain, actually, they want very much not to be in that transaction chain. Uh, they don't, it doesn't take much to persuade them to, to cut off that kind of business, because they really don't want to be in that kind of business, and they were appreciative of it. And at the same time, as you all know, we targeted the, the guilty parties in Iran, we exposed what they were doing, we made the, the illicit conduct public so that everyone knew this was going to be a serious effort and we're going to go after it. And we briefed our allies on the plan. We told these other governments who, were, who knew we had to put pressure on them what the plan was to impose this pressure. And it was a huge diplomatic effort. And it was not just the Treasury Department. We couldn't have done it ourselves. You know, every uh, government leader was helping. Uh, when congressional leaders went, actually now I'm looking at uh, former Representative Harmon because she used to call me when she was going on trips and say, oh, here's who I'm meeting with. You know, how can I help? And we used to you know, collaborate to get uh, support from the Hill to get people to work with us on this. And I remember conversations with her uh, about that. And it worked like we hoped. Uh, the banks did cut off the business, the private sector did cut off the business, and it did make it easier to, uh, to build that coalition. And over time, the skepticism toward it faded. Uh, and we were able to get you know, much, much tougher sanctions uh, over time. There are lots of other things that contribute to that, but it was part of it. Uh, and again, Iran, as we predicted, tried to evade. They tried to evade the sanctions, and unlike prior country sanctions where evasion works, we, made, we turned evasion into an advantage for us because we, would, because we had good intelligence, we could expose the evasion and continue to use it to feed the same dynamic. Um, and you know, as we heard in the, in the first panel, it, it's unclear how this thing will end. You know, no, no one knows how it will end. But uh, to the extent uh, Iran is considering giving up its, its nuclear weapons, its pursuit of nuclear weapons, uh, it's certainly been at least in part, because of the leverage that comes from a properly you know, executed set of financial measures. And uh, I think it's been a true bipartisan success. As I, as I just mentioned, this is a strategy that had complete support from Democrats during the Bush administration and complete support from Republicans during the Obama administration. And that's something which I personally found maybe the most gratifying part of it. Um, so I just want to make a couple of points about how TFI can build on this, this record of success. And you know, I don't think that just, uh, we, we, we had breakfast this morning and, and, and David and Secretary Liu were saying that you know, we've got to continue to innovate uh, if it's going to continue to be successful. The bad guys are going to innovate, we have to continue to innovate. And I just wanted to make two, two points, and they actually tie to the two panels that you're going to hear later. One about the role of the private sector where Reuben Jeffrey and, and Neil Wollen are going to speak, and then one about intelligence. And the private sector, I think, has been crucial, as I, as I said, to the success of TFI, that they've been able to build this uh, uh, partnership with the private sector and get the private sector to amplify their actions. Uh, but there's another aspect to the relationship between uh, the Treasury and the private sector, and that's the flow of information back and forth. And that has been something that has greatly improved since 9-11 in the last 10 years. The, the kind of information that goes back and forth between the government and the private sector has improved. Both the reporting that, that 
uh, that, that we do, I say we now because I'm, I'm obviously in the private sector now at a very large bank, the reporting that we do uh, to the government and also some information we get back from the government. That said, I think this is, uh, this is an area where there is still great untapped potential for better collaboration. And I use the word collaboration uh, uh, intentionally because um, there is a shared objective which is the integrity of the financial system. Between uh, the, the private sector has that and the government has it. And there are shared adversaries, which are illicit actors. Again, the private sector has the same adversaries uh, that the government does. But in many ways, the government and the private sector are sort of fire, fighting against the shared adversary with one arm tied behind their back because they're not, com they're not collaborating with the information as, best, as, as, they, as, as well as they could. For the most part, the institutions are analyzing their own information, putting it together with what they can, uh, what they can purchase and, and glean from the public, uh, public sources and commercial databases, and trying to find the anomalies, trying to find the bad guys, so that they can then share that information with the government. Uh, they do that, for the most part, without the benefit of maybe the most important insight they could have, which is, what is it that the government is already seeing and worried about? What is it that they you know, what is their analysis of the particular threat? And uh, I believe that it is a potential game changer uh, in this effort if there could be found a way to collaborate better. And I know this is, there's a lot of good hard work already going on about this, but the, the collaboration yet is not yet comprehensive. And if we could get it to be that way, everyone would benefit because the kind of information and the kind of analysis that the private sector would pass back to the government would be so much more valuable and rich, and that would help the government to understand uh, the threats. And I think this is something which, from my current position, I see even more as uh, an opportunity for, uh, for building on prior success. The second point I'd like to make is, is about the role of intelligence. Um, as I said a couple of times, intelligence is absolutely key to uh, these strategies. And um, there's been, you know, there's a lot of debate, obviously, in the, in the public now about the, uh, what is the appropriate amount of intelligence collection. And uh, I think that debate is you know, healthy in a democracy. It's perfectly appropriate. And I don't intend to kind of weigh in uh, heavily uh, on the whole debate. But I just want to make one point, which is that um, People should consider the cost of not being able to do this. Um, you know, what, what David and Danny Glazer and Adam tried to present to the president in very tough circumstances are real options to uh, deal with tough problems that, um, and to do so in a way where, you know, their military force isn't going to be needed. Um, and, you can't overestimate the value of that if you can settle something without, without uh, military force. Um, without the kind of uh, information and intelligence that can feed a real strategy, then you're left with these kind of sanctions that we know, you know all these people who are writing about them were right. They don't work. Uh, and so you're going to leave the president without that, that kind of authority. It's very hard to value that, you know, what is the value of that, but I think it's, it's substantial uh, to, to be able to have those kind of strategies offered uh, to the president uh, when he's got very, very tough decisions to make. And I know it's something that uh, the Treasury Department uh, really needs this information. Um, I'm going to just uh, stop there. I want to thank you all again for letting me participate in this. I, uh, I, w I spent seven years working alongside the team uh, at the Office of Ter Terrorism and Financial Intelligence at Treasury. and. Everyone who knows, who worked with me at the time knows that this is, when I say this next thing is really from the heart, that was for me an honor of a lifetime. Uh, and I'm very proud that we've put together something that is, uh, that has stood the test of time. And I'm uh, most proud of the fact that it's, it is a bipartisan thing. Uh, that it is something that everyone uh, recognizes as valuable. And uh, um, I hope that it will remain that way. I'm sure under David's leadership it will. Thank you. Okay. 
so our, our next panel uh, uh, is on, uh, timely enough, uh, intelligence uh, and the future of intelligence and what we do. Uh, the moderator is David Sanger of the New York Times. Where is David? There is David Sanger of the New York Times. Uh, and the panelists are Keith Alexander, Michelle Flournoy, and Jane Harmon. So welcome them to the stage. Thank you very much. I'm David Sanger from uh, the New York Times, and a uh, great honor to be here at the uh, CSIS uh, uh, event here. And our discussion today is going to be about financial intelligence. It flows very nicely from what you just heard from uh, Stuart and also from the, the first panel. And we've got uh, a great panel of uh, experts here. Uh, to my uh, immediate left, your right, Michelle Flournoy, who was, uh, of course, Under Secretary policy at the uh, Pentagon for uh, how many years? Three. Three. Uh, and uh, is, has, has been, been out just about long enough now to have plunged back in at, C <laughs> at CNAS. Uh, Jane Harmon, who of course served in Congress and uh, served a number of different uh, intelligence committees uh, along the way and now runs uh, the Wilson Center. And uh, General Keith Alexander, who um, just left uh, eight years, was it eight years at, uh, at NSA? The eight last years. year was a doozy. Uh, <laughs> out of, out of, it's uphill in the rain. Yeah. <laughs> Some people try to leave the last year of their job quietly, but uh, General Alexander <laughs> decided that would be too boring. That's right. uh, so um, our, my hope today is to, to pick up uh, from uh, where the panels were, talk a little bit about the role of intelligence in some of these individual cases, and then look forward to where these tools are going, how they've been affected by some of the recent uh, disclosures, but also begin to talk about um, what kind of utility they could have that we haven't thought of yet, that uh, you know, where, 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 this may be, uh, where this may be headed. Um, I thought that one place to start might be um, with the question of um, what's worked and, and what hasn't, something that you heard Tom Donlan and Steve Hadley take up. And uh, Mr. Donlan made the point that, for example, we've been much more successful in the sanctions implementation in Iran than we have in North Korea. And one of the natural questions that raises is, is that because of the unity on sanctions, or is that in part because of the intelligence challenge that one, one faces? Obviously, Iran is a much more interconnected society, so there are a lot more opportunities, a lot more transactions to go look at. North Korea, obviously, a much more reclusive one. But Michelle, let's, let's start with you on, on that subject. Uh, what's your overall sense about if this is an intelligence issue versus non-intelligence related challenges? Well, I, I do think that having a very uh, uh, high quality of detailed financial intelligence uh, with regard to Iran's money flows um, did enable us to build a much stronger sanctions regime than had previously been possible in a couple of ways. One was the one that Stuart mentioned in that we could go to private sector entities and raise their level of awareness of the reputational risk of you know, their dealings with some of these Iranian um, entities and financial institutions. But the second is on the diplomatic side. When you walk into a country you know, like uh, China or Russia that, where there may be some at least ambivalence if not reluctance to go headlong into joining a sanctions regime and you're able to not just you know, urge them with, with arguments but actually show them specific relationships and specific financial flows that tie directly to um, illicit activities um, that they themselves have are on record condemning. Um, that's extremely helpful, right? I mean, it, it just 
puts the diplomatic conversation on a completely different basis. Sure, you're, you're talking like somebody who has a specific uh, memory in mind no of moments of dealing. No specific memories at ah. all. <laughs> um, and uh, I, would I think most of those discussions, frankly, happened between um, my State Department colleagues with the help of Stuart and then David mm -hmm. alongside them too, and, and Neil often as But your well. point is that the Chinese can't simply say, all this kind of stuff happens, who right. knows, we've asked them for, we've asked them to cease and desist. Right. It's a different thing. You could thing. say, you know, Institution X and Institution Y are having these kinds of relationships and, and flows, and that's going to put your institutions at risk, it's going to put you politically at risk in terms of being a power that's your anti-proliferation and yet allowing this to go on right under your nose. So I think it's, the detailed intelligence was extremely helpful in uh, making the diplomacy more effective. The point was made in uh, the first session that, uh, I think uh, Tom Donlin made it, that the um, North Korea was really the first place where we saw a lot of this being used uh, mm -hmm. with the Macau Bank. This was both obviously during the, the Bush administration. And then we saw some pulling back later on uh, at that time. But uh, Jane, you were in Congress at that time. Tell us what lessons you think one should have emerged from the Macau Bank experience and the North Korea experience and then carried forward into Iran and into the financial terrorism cases. Okay, well, let me make a, a couple of general comments first. First, my Stuart Levy story. I mean, he told the Muammar Gaddafi story, so I'm telling my Stuart Levy story. So I'm on the House Intelligence Committee. I'm the senior Democrat, and I just love this guy. He's so good at what he does. So I remember telling him, Stuart, you can never leave. And, you know, it's an edict. How'd that I mean, work? She started <laughs> trembling. No, no, you, you left first. So uh, I repeated that every time I saw him. And then, so finally, one Sunday night, I'm at home eating dinner with my family, and the phone rings. Hi, Jane, it's Stuart. I'm leaving. And I, I it was a hugely disruptive moment in my life. I never really <laughs> recovered. But I think he was also trembling. So I was pleased to have that impact on him. But it, it turns out, as fabulous as he was, that the crowd that has followed is also fabulous. So that was, that's kind of my personal story. Now about all this stuff. Um, a few comments about Congress, and I may be the only recovering politician in the room. Is anybody else in my situation? <laughs> Isn't that fabulous? You are all so, so much more intelligent that you didn't pick that line of work. But, but seriously, um, one of the best things you can say about Congress and this program is that Congress has not messed it up. And it has been treated as a bipartisan effort from day one. I have seen no, this is probably singular, sniping that is partisan in nature. I'm sure some folks like this and don't like that, but I haven't seen one shred of it. Uh, and that is truly amazing. So uh, congratulations to all of you for doing this job in such a, a seamless way. But on the sanctions, um, I, I, I may be right or not, and, and David, but I think that, that in this case, Congress hasn't micromanaged this either. And in terms of sanctions against specific banks, um, that judgment and has been delegated totally to people who actually know what they're doing. Um, and so in the Macau case and, and North Korea, uh, I don't think, I mean, obviously North Korea went ahead and did what it did, so I don't think it paid a penalty in the way that other places have. I mean, I, I, I just say that I, I'm one who thinks that the sanctions against Russia played a very big role in, in Russia's um, change of course on, on, on Ukraine. I think they worked, even though a lot of people poo-pooed this and said just sanctions on individuals don't matter, they mattered. So I think in general this stuff matters. On North Korea, I think less effective. I don't think that means that this crowd was not effective. I just think North Korea, because of its uh, uh, sort of strange economy, has less, can be less impacted by sanctions than perhaps other places. Okay. Um, General Alexander, uh, let's start first with this question of whether or not it was the intelligence on Iran that made it 
so much more effective, whether how that compares with dealing with a society like uh, North Korea. And then I wanted to take you to some of the terrorism examples that Treasury is, uh, has pursued in recent times. I actually, well, first, Juan, thanks, thanks for bringing this up, and thanks for all you did. It was a privilege and honor to work with you, uh, Stuart, David, Leslie, uh, really has been. And uh, you know, I think what they've done for our country, uh, mm -hmm. what Treasury has done in this here, area, here. has been absolutely superb. I think we owe them a big round of applause. Here, here. It's the only way I can get an applause. So, so when you when you look at the impact that you can have on a country like Iran, and I agree with what uh, Jane said, the fact is, um, Iran's mm -hmm. you know, and by withholding it, you can have a larger impact. But if you don't have anything, telling them you're going to take something away when they look around and say, what's left? Uh, which is essentially where we are in North Korea. I think the, the differential is much less. I do think there are credible cases where both of these apply to it where it can. And so from my perspective on the intel side, I think there's great work being done. It's just the impact on Iran is going to be more. You can have more. And they're more connected. Their people in Iran see this. They're a factor factor and it impacts the people, it makes it more difficult on the regime. And so I think that in and of itself is a big differential. Where in North Korea, the people are essentially out. There is no real credible network there where the North Korean people see that difference. So I think when you combine all that, that's really the real case that I think drives the apparent success of sanctions on Iran versus North Korea. And how much time at the NSA do you spend devoting resources, signals intelligence resources, financial flows, and to what degree is that done now elsewhere in the centers that uh, uh, Stuart was just describing and, and so forth? Has I there think been a change of mission over the years you were there? Well, I don't spend any anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so it's down to zero. Um, but uh, they were great partners. I think they're doing incredible work. Um, and uh, so, you know, and the counterterrorism and on the sanctions, uh, a great partner for the whole intelligence community, not just NSA. And so we were part of a bigger team that was working this in the interest of our country and our allies. I think the people who understand the financial stuff really brought in some great, great work here. We had some great uh, analysts that we uh, occasionally use, okay, all the time, uh, that helped in this case. <laughs> How's that? Um, so I wanted to turn to a couple of cases involving terrorism. We asked Treasury uh, in the run-up to this if they could give us a list of some cases which have come out into the public now uh, in which um, there were good examples of the terrorist finance tracking program uh, being used. Um, one they brought up uh, that uh, we've been discussing here was the investigation into um, the uh, uh, the Nawaz uh, brothers. These were they, they were arrested in uh, September of last year. They were traveling uh, from France. They were arrested in the UK, I believe, uh, <laughs> and they were accused of traveling to a terrorist camp in Syria. And data that was derived from the finance program provided a lot of the transaction information, account numbers, and so forth. That I guess helped track them, but. I was hoping that by use of an example like this, um, and you can uh, generalize these out to, to some other cases, you might be able to give us a little bit of a sense of how this actually works in, in real life. Uh, I think that's a great example. If I, could give, if I could just step back and give some information for everybody here, I think this is really important to set the, the stage for what's going on in the terrorism arena. When you look at 2012, there were 6,771 attacks and uh, over 11,000 people were killed. If you go to 2013, that grew to 10,301 attacks and over 20,641 deaths, almost doubled. And that's an incredible set of statistics. Now we can argue, this is the University of Maryland START program that does it for state departments, so state will go through counted this level of thing. My, my comment is, look, let's argue over the things, but look, it doubled in a year. Syria is really a problem. 
and our intelligence analysts across the community have tools to work with. And we were, we were talking about that. What kind of tools do they have? Well, they have this, they have the metadata programs, they have everything to work with. Where they're trying to guess like a wheel of fortune, uh, there's a set of blank numbers up here. You get to say, I can use this program. Is there a T? And if a T doesn't come up, they say, is there a and if there is, they can put that on there and start to, to look at letters. And armed with that, what they are able to do is get out in front. And that's what happened to the Nawaz brothers. When you think about it, because they had information, account numbers, and all these things that you named there, they were able to see from guys who had been trained in Syria, who were traveling through France to Dover, were picked up because there was information that from this program and others were able to stop. But that's not the key thing for us to remember. The key thing is the terrorist program, and there's a bunch more in this whole thing. There were 20,000 people killed in 2013. Look at how secure Europe and the United States are. Why is that? It's because of the great, per, uh, great work of people like this across the community, pulling all those tools together, and putting them on the table. Now, the great part about this set of tools, the thing that I think is really good about this tools that sets the framework, is it's been done with Europe and We agree with the way you're using it. We'll give you access to it. We're all in because we see what you're doing with it. And that may, these tools that, that they've set up, may set a framework for using other tools like metadata. And I think that's a huge step forward for us because it's not gonna get less. You know, the DNI talked about what's going, coming out of Syria. So you have the Nawaz brothers, but there's several thousand in Syria. A great deal of them coming out of Europe, some out of the United States. It's gonna happen. We need these tools, and we need partnerships with countries in Europe and around the world if we're gonna stop them. Well, Michelle, you were in, um office at the beginning of the Syrian revolution, of course, during the, the early days of the uh, Arab revolutions. And you were getting this constant flow of both um, the financial data and then the other data that you're using, of course, to try to target individual cells and so forth and have to make the decisions along the way about where the limits are on, on what the US can go do. Tell us a little bit about um, how the kind of financial data plays in, that you're getting from these kind of programs, plays in with the other stream of information and decisions you're having to make along the way? Well, I think in, with, whether it's the case of Syria or other cases like Afghanistan, um, Iraq, um, what this kind of financial intelligence becomes a pretty critical enabler for lots of other agencies as well. So. In some cases, it's going to enable a combination of justice and law enforcement to actually take, you know, to pursue prosecutions or to take law enforcement action. One of the things we saw, we had an Afghan um, threat finance cell on the ground, which had not only uh, traditional intelligence community representatives, but folks from Treasury, folks from DOD, folks from DEA, FBI, and the pooling of the information, the pooling of authorities, and the fact that we had vetted Afghan partner units to work with meant that you had much greater effectiveness in actually taking some of this data and disrupting the financial flows um, that were supporting the insurgency um, and associated groups. Um, this kind of data also has helped enormously for um, DOD special operations forces to really just better their understanding of these networks. Um, and so if there is an occasion where the military has to action a target, having the understanding of the financial flows is just that much, helps, helps you understand the network that much better. Um, I also think that this kind of work, when it's done interagency and with partners, can be ve a very important part of building partner capacity for taking action. I mean, the president in his speech lately just recently talked about a shift towards really emphasizing building the capacity of partners at the local level to deal with terrorism on their soils. This kind, helping them use this kind of information, develop their own sources of this kind of information would be very, very important. 
And then the last thing I'd note is, you know, in the case of Syria, you have uh, groups like Hezbollah, very, very um, active. I mean, some of the sources of Hezbollah's funding with regard to international drug trafficking and so forth, we talk about reputational risk. I mean, you know, having the opportunity to publicize some of that, the sources of their funding, which are very much uh, cast a, you know, raise a lot of questions about their stated, um, uh, you know, uh, poke a lot of holes in their rhetoric, shall we say, in terms of what, what they're trying to do uh, in the region. Um, so I think, you know, this is an enabler for law enforcement, for um, under, helping our military understand these networks and our intelligence community writ large for partner capacity building for, and for putting some of these groups at reputational risk. And again, whether it's Syria or Afghanistan, you know, I think these elements are common across the various cases. You know, you talked before about the utility in, say, dealing with the Chinese on, say, weapons proliferation in North Korea. Uh, tell us a little bit in the terrorist case, if you track something back and it ended up in Saudi Arabia or some other country where there's obviously been a lot of funding going on of, uh, of madrasas and so forth. Um, how did that same dynamic that you described with the Chinese, for example, translate when you're doing this in the, in the terror context? Sure, I, I, you know, I think it, it does, has enabled conversations with certain countries about uh, support that is happening in their society that they may or the state may or may the state may not condone and may not even be aware of. Um, I have my my own knowledge has to do more with the case of Pakistan, mm -hmm. where we were able to trace financial flows across the border and among different groups, uh, and and even you know initially when the Pakistani authorities were sort of in denial about some of what was happening. Um, uh, to, and, and supporting a terrorist and insurgent action coming across the border that was directly impact American, uh, impacting American forces, we were able to say, no, <laughs> here's the evidence. This is happening. Look, look for yourselves. Um, so I think it can be, again, make the, make the diplomatic effort much more compelling. And is there ever a kickback to that? Maybe you've seen or Jane, you saw in, in Congress or maybe since you've left, where you begin to develop the um, reaction from the target country that comes back and says, you know, this is not an appropriate use of your intel um, capability because, of course, they're, they would rather maintain the ambiguity. You ever, you ever see any objections to the U.S. program in that, in that form? Well, I saw, you know, a feigned outrage uh -huh. uh, because deniability is built into a lot of the actions of governments, including our government. Uh, that's sort of part of the whole intel landscape. I also saw efforts which are longstanding. I don't think they were developed to defeat these, these programs, but they, they work. I mean, the, uh, the Hawala network uh, is one, the sort of barter system in Muslim countries makes it very hard to track what's going on. And another is just the moving of large amounts of cash that don't go through financial institutions, which still happens. And uh, I remember the frustration of some of us in Congress on the Intelligence Committee trying to figure out who was supporting Hamas and who was supporting some of the terror operations in the, in the region, uh, 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 especially in Gaza against Israel. And, you know, $25,000 a head went to families of uh, suicide bombers, for example, and where did that money come from and how did it get there? And uh, um, we, we had a lot of trouble. Just, just one more comment about this, because I, I do think it's such an effective remedy, and I, and I think the Treasury Department so capably uh, applies it. Uh, and that is, I, let's never underestimate our asymmetric strength using using financial tools against either non-state actors or state actors. Um, a lot of state economies are very fragile, and obviously individual wealth, if, if, if you can bar people's access to assets, is fragile. And these tools are just enormously effective. I, I don't think we have any other tools that are this effective. And a, a final comment, just in terms of Congress's bipartisan support, is 
that in each party there are, and no one has missed this, sort of isolationist wings, or in the Democratic Party sense, more of a pacifist wing, and um, engagement wings. And financial tools um, are supported by both of these wings. Um, uh, military tools are not, and in certain other kinds of engagement tools are not. So this is probably the best set of, of uh, uh, weapons that we have in a very dangerous world. Uh, General Alexander, in your first set of comments, you made the observation that because the Europeans and others have been so helpful in the financial area, this may be a building block to get them to help in metadata programs, other intelligence collection. But if you look across Europe these days, in fact, if you hear anything, you hear something in the reverse direction, that since the revelations of the past year, including the surveillance of uh, European leaders, Chancellor Merkel and others, but also the revelation of some of these programs. But if anything, it seems as if there's pressure on these governments not to cooperate less than they have. Uh, and uh, you heard in one of the earlier sessions that there is a sense, I think Steve Hadley said, that the Europeans don't believe they're under as great a terror, potential terrorist threat as the United States does, that they don't believe that the weapons proliferation threat is as great. So in the last year, that famous last year you had in office, did you see a, a reversal of cooperation in any way in, in some of these cases? I think there's a public uh, discussion and then private work. I think all the countries realize the threats uh, on terrorism. And anyone that says they don't, uh, I think, is not being uh, candid because they get, and they're ones wrapping up the terrorists. Um, we give them the, the leads, they wrap them up. And <clears throat> they know that this type of data is helping them. I, I think you asked a, a, an important thing here that I would just take the next step on, and that is, so the terrorist program actually has a way of, of Treasury can go to Europol, show that the data they're requesting meets a set of standards that everybody's agreed to. And so my comment with respect to the metadata program is in reality, <coughs> Europe and many of the European nations have a way of working with metadata. So do we. And we want it for a common good. Why can't we use that together and come up with a framework that does it and helps us? And I think we can. And I think there is good in taking these steps on what we can do together. That's a policy decision, it's not, not mine, now as a, as a citizen, but what I can say is there is tremendous value in the partnership. And I think what the, what the policymakers need to do, that's Mich Michelle and company. I'm a former too. Former policymaker. <laughs> would do is recovering, say. I recovering, think recovering. Recovering, yeah. So what they would do is say, so where is the benefits here? From my perspective, it's gonna be in the counterterrorism and in the cyber arena. We have to work together here. We've got to set this, we've got to set the framework up. going to have to settle, and here's where we will never agree. And in those, I think you've got, you've got some of these. Every nation is going to act in its best interest. You, it gets down to it. Nations and the elected officials are responsible for protecting that nation, are going to act in their best interest. That's us. That's all the other countries. Michelle, he's perfectly set you up because uh, Sorry. Where, this is, where this is going uh, a few years out. So we heard in the first session significant disagreements on cyber policy, not only between the US and China, where we're defining the problem differently, but I would say the US and Europe, where the privacy uh, debate is underway in a, in a great way. Um, differences with many of our other partners. So um, if, if you had to look at where you would, you would like to see this and where you think it will be in five years, the degree of cooperation on things like terrorist finance, on setting some common rules on cyber that would enable the, the intelligence to go beyond just finance. Wh where do you think we will be? Those are two different things, where I would well, like you, us to be and where we may You can be. answer them separately. So, uh, <laughs> you know, where I would like us to be is, um, you know, having benefited from a truly sort of elevated strategic debate about the, the benefits and you know, risks to be managed associated with collecting and using different kinds of metadata. Um, I would like to have that intelligence 
dispassion, you know, intelligent, dispassionate conversation in the United States. I know that's a big, a tall order. And then based on that, have some no, a, a much you know, stronger foundation for the congr some legislation and some reform that we need. I mean, we need cyber legislation in this country. Right. The danger is we're gonna rush to it based on the emotional response to the Snowden leakage as opposed to based on a truly informed strategic debate about benefits and risks and how best to manage the latter. And what would you and like would that, hope, what would you hope that, that legislation had in it? I, I think that um, I would hope that, that it would have um, positive sort of post-war uh, authorization of certain types of um, cyber uh, collection and analysis because I think it's, it is a critical tool. Um, I also would like to see the same kind of discussion um, in, in Europe and then building some kind of cooperative framework, again, that is rooted in a balancing of the very real security risks and the very real privacy concerns. Right now, we have a lot of heat and very little light. We have a lot of emotion. We have a lot of people using this for political purposes. And if that's the basis on which either we in the United States or the, our, our close partners in Europe actually come up with legislation, we will get it exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. Janie, at the Wilson uh, Center, you are going to be doing a conference, I think, in, in about two days' time on the post-Snowden period. And what, one of the features that we have seen of this, uh, which speaks right to what Michelle was discussing, is we've got individual countries now talking about walling off parts right. of their internet. Uh, exactly. Part of the exactly wrong. Right. Yeah. So that was that was sort of my yeah. question, which is, uh, what's the what's the actual danger if that happens, both to intelligence gathering and also just to internet freedom? Well, let's uh, start with Edward Snowden. I'm hopeful that his 15 minutes are almost up. Um, <laughs> I thought his interview the other night with the NBC was. Uh, extremely revealing of his uh, incredible personal arrogance and, and misguided approach to all this. He's not a whistleblower. Uh, there's no real evidence that he is. It would have been nice, by the way, Keith, I'm sure you don't disagree with me, if the NSA had been able to put out this email chain, this pathetic little email chain earlier. Um, but at any rate, it's out. And he's not a whistleblower, and his actions moving first to China and then to Russia are enormously suspicious, whatever they may turn out to be. And claiming that none of his material was exploited just it doesn't pass the laugh test. Having said that, the debate we're having is useful. And I keep cringing every time someone talks about the balance between security and liberty. I don't think it's a zero-sum game. I think it's a positive-sum game. And this relates to everything you're asking me, David. Um, I think we either protect civil liberty and security at the same time, or we have neither of those things. And as we think forward to what we should do in this country and how we should collaborate with others, we have to keep that in mind. The cyber legislation that Congress is not passing um, has to include a requirement for the private sector to share, and then indemnification to the private sector if they share information. 85% of the cyber capacity in this country, or the last time I looked, is in private hands. Let's understand that, including a lot of our grids that uh, are essential to keep all of us safe from cyber attacks. So there better be some cooperation. And um, they're not sharing you know, for competitive advantage and for fear of lawsuits. So they have to share. And Congress has not made this possible. It takes legislation. There is an executive order. It's just not adequate. As to the international scene and balkanizing, the internet. It is a, such a dumb idea. It's just staggeringly dumb. And I think in technological terms, Keith would know, I don't really, I don't think it can work. Um, but this notion, even that US providers are going to set up different protections for Europeans and so on in different places, I, 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 I view as really pretty silly. And I think in the end, consumers are, are not going to want this. They may purchase it, and then they're going to figure out that there are firewalls blocking them from getting things that they really want that are not in their particular uh, service provider's uh, range of action. So I think this thing will fall to a, a great big thud in the, in the virtual world, a virtual thud. 
and, and won't work. But back to the beginning, uh, we need to have the right conversation in this country and internationally uh, with, with the anxious publics in both places that explains why security and liberty are not a zero-sum game. And if we can make that sale, and it will take some serious conversation and some intelligent hearings in Congress, that may be an oxymoron, but if we could do that, uh, I think uh, in the end we would have decent cyber legislation and decent cyber regimes, uh, which would be good, it's norms of international con conduct that will in the end protect consumers and the, and the public better than anything else. Well, we have about uh, 10 or 12 minutes left to take a few questions from the audience. We'll ask that they be succinct and bear in mind that your questions are the last thing between uh, all of your compatriots here and lunch. Uh, so we'll start with you, ma'am, right here. That's the microphone's kind of here. Uh, good morning. Hi, hi, General. Hi, Jane, how are you? I don't know. Uh, you, Michelle, but I think Michelle. you're really brilliant. You should have been National Security Advisor. But this is, <laughs> my question okay. is uh, twofold. We removed the sanctions, we removed the, the defense shield from Poland because the argument at the democratically controlled Congress was that Iran wasn't a threat. Then we moved even further and we decide to remove the sanctions from Iran, even though we know that Iran, along with Russia and China are obtaining uh, uh, electronic and computer and information they shouldn't be. I, I, I need to understand what type of smart power was it to remove the sanctions from Iran um, at the time we removed them when we're not out of Afghanistan and Iran is using water and other forms of so we're talking financial, but let's um, uh, deal with Michelle. You want to two, deal with two policy points question. of clarification? Um, one is that um, we have not removed the sanctions. The sanctions remain in place. There, when Iran accepted the interim deal, which halts its program, there was a very small release of frozen assets or funds, but there, the sanctions regime is still very much in place. Every intent of keeping that, uh, that regime in place um, until we get to the objective <coughs> of uh, preventing Iran from from pursuing nuclear weapons um, and, and reaching a final agreement. The other point of clarification is um, we didn't abandon missile defense in Europe. We deployed a, a more robust system more quickly. That includes uh, systems that are already being deployed in Poland today um, and in Turkey and, and with the SM3 uh, you know, Block 2 missile and so forth, which is actually a more capable system that will be deployed faster than the original timeline. So, and that is because there is shared US and European concern over the ballistic missile threat that Iran uh, poses to Europe. Steve Clements. Uh, sometimes talking about fiction allows us to talk about the real world more easily. Uh, David Ignatius's, one of his last novels, Blood Money, essentially takes financial tracking intelligence, and you see in that novel that that is uh, taken by adversaries and used against agents of the CIA, the NSA, and others. Uh, and I'm interested in to what degree implied in our discussion today is the United States is in such a leading position in this capacity. There hasn't been discussion that much about uh, where the gap is with the next leaders and whether or not some of what we're talking about today can be used in a way against uh, American interests by others. Good question. General Alexander, what did you see in the way um, uh, American partners and adversaries were developing their own capabilities? Here? Well, I think, you know, this is the issue about the bulk, it almost drops you back to the balkanization. <clears throat> and, you know, it is interesting to see technically what's going on um, out there and how good Silicon Valley and all the people we have are in advancing some of these technologies. It's doubling every two years, which means that what you learned in your first year
out and going against that kind of power doesn't make sense. You know, it quickly gets you to uh, dropping back analogous to where Iran has dropped back because of sanctions and the way they live today. If you look at their infrastructure versus everybody else. With respect to others using this against us, though, you know, I think there's always a concern of countries going after ours, the, the risk of the dollar and things like that. Affected not just by us, but by many countries. And I think uh, in some of these areas, we need partners and allies to take the same kind of stance that we do. It can't be done alone. Um, Unless uh, we can't get anybody, I recognize that you know the White House policymakers can choose to do something like that, but it sure is strengthened when you get others involved in it. I've not seen, though, to that extent where it's been used that way, uh, and I'm trying to think of a case, but I can't think of one. I can see where they're using it to attack people. The uh, Barbsier case is one of the ones that they released where I think it was $100,000 to go after the Saudi ambassador here in the U.S. in Washington. Mm -hmm. So when you start to look at some of those, uh, there is tremendous impact that these programs have. Mm -hmm. There's a question, hand down here, right here. Hi, uh, Nicholas Anzinger. I'm an intern here at CSIS. I greatly enjoyed your talk. My question is, um, are American and other Western multinational oil companies who are doing business in Russia like Exxon, Shell, and Stat Oil, are they affected by sanctions against Russia? If so, how? Who's best on this? Uh, anybody? Have you on, I, on what I, the actual effect has been? I, I, go, go ahead, Jim. Go ahead. No, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> He's me. I, I know the answer is yes, but. The Question to the yes. audience here, yes. so, or one yes. free answer. David, David you, knows. David, you want to pick that one up? Yeah. Go ahead, David. Well, As has been noted, the sanctions uh, in uh, relation to the Russia-Ukraine situation have been largely focused on individual actors, not on, uh, not on the companies in Russia. Um, that being said, uh, the fact that we have applied sanctions against a number of significant Russian business people, including some of the cronies quite close to President Putin, uh, who themselves supervise significant operations in Russia in the, in the energy sector and other sectors, has had a chilling effect. And I think Secretary Liu noted this in his remarks, that the, the sanctions and the threat of sanctions and the fact that we have the ability under uh, a recently adopted executive order to apply sanctions against uh, actors in various sectors of the Russian economy, including the energy sector, the financial sector, what have you, combined with the fact that we have, in fact, applied sanctions against individuals who are the, the chief operating officers of some of these entities, Thank you. Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council and I'll monitor.com. And David Cohen is welcome to answer this one, too. Uh, this morning has been. We should been, just get them on up here. <laughs> <laughs> this, this morning has been all about the success of sanctions, uh, how well they've worked, reputational risk, how well it's worked, and how the private sector is totally spooked by all of them, and so on. Is there a concern that it's going to be difficult to unravel these sanctions? And in the event there is, an agreement with Iran, Iran is going to insist on this, but once you have terrified the private sector into avoiding a country, how do you convince them that it's safe to go back? Well, let's divide that question up into two parts. The, part number one, which I'd like to give to Jane, is let's say there was an Iran deal. It, it, this takes three deals, one between the US and the Europeans and Iran, uh, Western and 
the others in the, uh, in the group. Uh, one between the Iranians uh, and negotiators and uh, the clerics and, of course, the IOGC. Right. And then the hardest one of all between the president and Congress. So could you imagine Congress voting to lift the sanctions that Barbara was referring to if there was a deal? Uh, not easily. Uh, I think it would take. Everyone is aware, um, uh, Bob Menendez, who chairs the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, uh, has teed up uh, a bill to impose stronger sanctions and held it uh, for the nine-month period of the negotiation on the deal. And if there is no deal by whatever it is, end of July, I'm guessing, well, Congress will be in this back easily. I think it's a great question, Barbara. Are we ever going to undo these regimes? I also think that the sanctions on Iran have to do with more than the nuclear deal. They also have to do with Iran's conduct, bad conduct, uh, with respect to proxy terror organizations in the region. And that's not on the table. And, you know, uh, so I, I would say in the Iran case, um, very unlikely that all sanctions would be list lifted, certainly by the US. One last comment about the rest of the world. Uh, the French have already been in there having conversations. Nothing was consummated. Uh, but I think much of the world wants to resume trade with Iran and has agreed to our sanctions because the Treasury folks in the front row have been so brilliant at building an international coalition to do this. Um, but I think a lot of members of that coalition, if there is no deal, uh, are going to want to roll back their participation in the multilateral sanctions regime, and that will be very harmful to achieving the result we all want to achieve in Iran. You know, I, I, I just add to that. I think there's tremendous benefit if we can get an agreement to raising, to releasing, getting rid of the sanctions. And the reason is what that does is it gives the Iranian people more access to what's going on. And I think having them closer to the Western world is a good thing. And I think that's part of the solution, getting that information out there. They're good people. I think, you know, they, they, you know, if you sent Arnold Schwarzenegger or any movie star over there, they'd be treated great. And the problem is we're not communicating with them. So I think it's in all our best interest to get there. The problem, I, I agree, the problem is if they continue down the road to build a weapon, it polarizes the region in such a way that it just goes really bad. So we've got to win. We've got to get to that point. And that's a huge set of issues that are on the table. Michelle, any last thoughts on, on this and particularly on the Iran deal? What you think the big um, challenges would be if, you, if we actually got to a point of lifting sanctions? Um, I, do, I do think that um, getting some agreement about what are the elements of a good agreement. What does a bad agreement look like? What does a good agreement look like? Getting, doing some, and you know, think tanks can play an important role uh, in this regard of building that bipartisan consensus that is right now sorely absent and very much needed. I also think that, as you said, Israel will have a lot of influence as to how people view the ultimate terms of the agreement. So there are challenges associated with actually lifting the sanctions regime, but I also want to underscore something that Steve Hadley said earlier that even if we get to a good agreement, sanctions are lifted. Um, figuring out how do you hold Iran accountable uh, and prevent cheating, disincentivize them mm -hmm. uh, to, in terms of cheating, and what kind of instruments do you, short of the use of military force, do you have at your disposal? Which to may mean being able to turn these sanctions back on. Right, which is, I think we should not, um, <laughs> That would not be an easy task. Right. I mean, I think once, once this, this particular regime, which took years of handcrafting and you know, lots of work to get every, all the compliance that we've had and all the buy-in, once you let this go, there, I don't right. think there's any hope of getting anything that looks like this back for a long time. So figuring out what your leverage is 
to enforce this agreement, um, it, it speaks to the level of transparency and inspection and intrusiveness that you have to get as part of this, but it also speaks to thinking through what is going to be, what are your, it's going to be your enforcement leverage down the line. Very good. Well, I thank you very much. I think we have run uh, slightly over our time here. And uh, so thank you for your uh, uh, patience with that. And we look forward to the rest of the program.